it's a great pleasure for me today to present on behalf of uh, the PIs for our project, Professor Jose Villar and Stephen Kennedy, about the Intergrowth 21st project. What I'm going to sort of hopefully cover in the next sort of 25 minutes or 20, 25 minutes is a little bit about what is the problem that we're actually talking about here and, and, and why is it an, an issue globally, very briefly. I'm going to intru introduce you to the Intergrowth 21st project and then importantly to the, the products of the Intergrowth 21st project, which are our findings about growth across populations and the new international growth and gestational age standards for pregnancy and the newborn. So we, we've probably all heard about in the news and everywhere the importance of the growth in the first thousand days of life. I mean, increasingly this is being recognised as the key window when if you fail to intervene, it, you have not only higher rates of stillbirth, neonatal death, childhood mortality, but indeed long-term risks of adult cardiovascular disease, obesity, and susceptibility to infection. So it's really a huge area of research at the moment globally. I must say, as an obstetrician, I've been very guilty with my colleagues in that in pregnancy, we pretty much worry about babies dying in pregnancy or in the newborn period, but we've been very blinkered to the effects of poor growth during this period, what it could have on, on the rest of the, the, the baby's life. And indeed, it's shown sort of in this cartoon, which was on the, the poster thing, which shows that obviously life does not begin at birth. Some babies are born very unequal to others. And I guess our, our hypothesis in the intergrowth group was that these differences these two babies face are not due to the fact that uh, ethnically these babies are different babies. It's because of a lot of other adverse exposures which may be modifiable um, and, and you know, we need to be able to detect them. An important thing though which has happened in pregnancy and newborn care is to be able to detect the small baby, it depends very much on what chart you use to measure his weight or his length or his head circumference. And at the moment around the world, there is really no consensus at all on which chart should be used. And so babies who are born looking like this are compared against other babies born looking like this, and babies born looking like this are compared against smaller babies. And so we really don't have a great handle on how much how much growth restriction or growth problems there are at birth in the world, nor the other end of the spectrum of how many babies are getting too overweight and too fat. Um, our group did sort of three systematic reviews trying to sort of quantify the sort of confusion in this area, and I won't go through in detail, but there were sort of over 200 charts in the perinatal area which are commonly used around the world to map the size of babies. And so this is a lot of noise for researchers and any of you who are in sort of global epidemiology, it's very hard when we don't define the same thing. Uh, and this brings us to sort of a key concept in monitoring growth, which those of you who work in child growth will probably be familiar with. And this is the difference essentially between what is a reference, which describes how the growth is occurring in your population at the moment, which is what most of these charts are, versus a standard which describes how babies should grow if conditions for birth for growth are optimal. And nowhere has this been used better than in child growth with the WHO child growth standards. So these child growth standards were um, released in um, 1990, uh, the study was done in 1996 and the standards were released in 2006. And Mercedes de Onus at the WHO, who's the head of nutrition there, set up this study involving around 8,000 babies in six countries around the world. These babies were born to healthy mothers at full term, they were breastfed for six months of life, and they were followed for the first five years of their life. And what she found under those conditions was that the growth trajectory of children is remarkably similar if these conditions are met. This has justified 130 countries so far around the world adopting these standards to compare the growth of their children. So now when you hear the rates of stunting in India are uh, say 30% and the rate of stunting in Kenya is 20, 20%, you know that they're actually comparing the same thing, that the definition means the same. In pregnancy and at birth we have not had this until now and this is where the Intergrowth 21st project has come in to see if we can extend this concept of defining an optimal growth trajectory into the perinatal period. 
And so that brings us to the Intergrowth 21st project. So how did we do it? Well, the way it was done was based on that WHO child growth study in that they selected this time eight sites around the world. And you can see there the geographic spread is pretty broad. Uh, the ethnic mix, for want of a better word, is, is pretty broad across there with most major continental groups covered there. Um, but within these countries, obviously you could say, well, how are you going to pick somewhere in India? You know, the whole country's obviously got issues. What they did is they tried to pick populations, geographic areas within those countries where most of these conditions would be likely to met, be met, i.e. that they weren't exposed to severe adverse environmental contaminants, the, they had access to health care, they had access to adequate nutrition. And so these were, and, and this was described in a, in a paper how they, how they assessed these sites. Um, and so across all these eight sites, once they had been selected, what they then did was a population-based study of these eight sites where they followed all babies born across about a one-year period across these eight centres, which is almost 60,000 babies. And within these 60,000 babies, they selected about a third of them were classified as what we call low-risk pregnancies. What do I mean by low-risk pregnancies? Well, there's a whole long list of things, but I don't expect you to be able to read any of this. It's not an eye test. But the, the concept was that these women were not too old, too young, too fat, too thin. They did not have any known medical conditions when they were going into pregnancy. They did not have a bad obstetric history of having stillbirths or preterm births or anything like that. They did not use tobacco or alcohol or any other drugs. And a few sort of um, other parameters, like their blood pressure was normal, they were not anemic, um, and they weren't engaged in an occupation where they would be exposed to, to chemicals that could affect the growth of the baby. And so within these sort of selected eight populations, about a third of women met this criteria of being classified as low risk, i.e. their babies we expect would have a healthy growth trajectory. And of those 20,000, there were 4,607 who were then selected to be very closely studied for the growth of these babies across pregnancy. You could ask, why didn't they pick the whole 20,000? Well, there's a number of reasons. Probably the main reason for that was fairly pragmatic in that there is a limit to how many scans um, you know, the, the different research centres could do on these women during pregnancy. But also women you know, needed to consent for, um, to, to be part of the study, which was quite intensive in terms of their follow-up. And we also had to be extremely certain of their gestational age. Uh, and so these babies have made up the population from which the international fetal growth standards have been derived. Interestingly, within this very healthy 4,600 mothers, we were always interested in, in following the growth of the babies that were delivered preterm. Now, for those of you who don't work in the perinatal area, rates of preterm birth around the world generally hover around 10%. Preterm birth is now the number one killer of children under the age of five years, the single biggest cause of mortality. We found in these women, who were very selected, we admit, that their rate of preterm birth suddenly fell to 4.5%. So there's a lot of people in the preterm birth community who are very interested in this population as to what, what was it that, that really we could try and scale up in other, other settings that, that lowered this rate. But that's an aside. But we are producing preterm growth standards from that population. So those 4,600 mothers who are in the fetal growth study, what did they consent for? Well, they consented to have ultrasound scans every five weeks during pregnancy from uh, just after the first trimester, so um, starting from below 14 weeks of gestation. Um, this st study, the intergrowth study, has really set the bar in the field of ultrasound studies in pregnancy in that they were extremely meticulous with how these scans were done. Anyone who's ever been pregnant or known anyone pregnant or had a scan themselves will know that it's a very um, user-dependent technology ultrasound scan. And, and this is part of the, the reason why we cop a lot of flack as obstetricians because, you know, we'll say, oh, the estimated weight of the baby's four kilograms and then it comes out 4.5 kilograms and they'll say, you know, you're, you're really not very good. But, but part of it is because of this variation in 
the, the technique itself. So they, were, they went to extreme measures to try and standardise this across the eight countries, which you can imagine is no mean feat. As a first thing, everyone used the same ultrasound machine, so there wasn't differences in potential refractive abilities and things of the machines and transducers. Um, the measurements were all obtained in triplicate and they were all obtained blinded, which is very important because if you're measuring babies every day, day in, day out, you soon get to know what the size of the head of a baby at 20 weeks should be. And it's kind of unconscious natural human instinct to try and fudge the calipers to sort of match as close as you, you know it should be. So, so they really took care to try and minimise those potential sources of bias into the measurement. As well as this, they had a team in Oxford who were, were doing quality control on 10% um, of all the images captured, double checking the measurements and checking that sonographers uh, were capturing these in a standardised format. So it, as I say, it's really set the bar. At birth and at one year of age and at two years of age, all these babies were measured again using the same techniques as were used in the WHO study. And this again was done in a very rigorous way with two investigators doing each measurement three times. Um, we've also um, obtained funding from the Gates Foundation to follow these babies' neurodevelopment and this will also hopefully set the bar for how we assess children's sensory and neurodevelopment in years to come in that we will have a standard as to what children should be achieving if conditions are optimal and all the way that these tests have been developed uh, some of them are, are tests which have been around for a while, but some of them have been newly developed so they would be suitable for rollout in potentially all uh, income level settings, which is quite exciting. Um, for some of the babies, we're doing very fancy tests of body composition at birth. Like this is uh, the Peapod machine we've got in Oxford, uh, and that's being done in some of the centres as well. So all the methodology of this study has been published in a supplement in 2013 in the British Journal of ONG, and it's all available on our Global Health Network um, sort of member page if anyone is interested at all, but it, it really was quite an impressive feat. Um, and so what did, what did they find after all that? Well, this is the, the important bit. First of all, I want to introduce you to a biological concept when we are comparing growth across populations, and that is that it should be the skeletal growth that we use to compare population size rather than fat dependent um, sort of measurements such as the abdominal circumference or the thigh circumference or something like that. The reason for that is that things like abdominal circumference are very prone to sort of being skewed by overnutrition in populations. So certainly we see it here in the UK and in Australia where I'm from that our babies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we need to, to pick a measurement to compare which is skeletal measurements. The second concept which is really the hypothesis behind the Intergrowth Project was not that every baby in the world would be the same but that the variation in the sizes of babies would be more within um, a site than it would be between the sites. So this is an important concept that, because people always say with intergrowth, you know, how can you say an Indian baby is going to be the same as a UK baby? But what we're saying is the variation in the size of the Indian babies, that it, most of that variation is, is, is in the population, it's not between the two populations there. And I'll show you an example of this to make it clearer as we go on. So uh, the strategies for statistical analysis of how you combine so much data from eight sites were, were very carefully thought over. And Doug Altman from the Centre of Statistics and Medicine here in Oxford led this um, part of the project. And basically there were four main strategies they used. And I'll show you some of these today. So the first is just comparing the crude data. The second is a sensitivity analysis, seeing what uh, subtracting any one or, or more than one site from the analysis, what, what difference it made. The third was looking at the standardised site difference or seeing whether the measurements were within um, half a standard deviation, the, the, the size of the, the measurement at its site from the total standard deviation of all the measurements. And the fourth was a variant component analysis, uh, like an overtype analysis. Um, and so this was published uh, in the Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology in um, August in 2014. And this is the summary of, of the main findings of the project. So this is an ultrasound image for those of you who don't um, do this sort of work. 
Uh, obviously, looking through the fetal head, you can see the plane there that we've taken it. So this is the measure that we use for a skeletal measurement of fetal growth across pregnancy. What happens when we plot the actual measurements, so this is the crude data, from three of the country sites. So we've got the UK in purple dots, the USA in green dots, and Italy in the red dots. So each dot is a measurement taken on a baby. And you can see across the pregnancy, all the dots are pretty much overlapping all the other dots. So within these developed country sites, the, the fan or the range of size that your head circumference could be over your gestational age in weeks was, was pretty much overlapping. What happens when we start to add in some of the, the low and middle income countries? Well, when we add in China, we can see the dots again pretty much exactly overlap where the other countries' measurements were. Although in China you see an interesting uh, phenomenon which sort of had our statisticians racking their brains for a while as to why are they clustered so much along these, these, um, these blue splodges here. And the reason is that when we told the Chinese site to do scans every five weeks, that's exactly what they did every five weeks. So we had very precise data from China across those, that, that measurement. Uh, when we add in the Indian babies, they also plotted almost identically on, on this uh, range. Same with the Kenyan babies and babies from Amman and Brazil. So th this was pretty exciting that actually the growth of these babies under these conditions seemed to be very similar. And when we look earlier in pregnancy, we look at something called crown rump length, which is the whole length of the baby. And um, when we do what I said before, a sensitivity analysis, where we subtract one country at a time, it, it really made it almost a sort of negligible difference to the, where the curves for the 3rd, 50th and 97th centiles for crown rump length for the early gestations are. And this was the same thing we saw for that head circumference measurement later in pregnancy. So quite impressive um, stuff. Um, when we look at when the babies are born, um, because this is also an important thing, is how we measure the baby at birth, we found that the lengths of the babies also were almost identical, the, the, the centile thresholds across the sites, and excluding um, each of the, the low and middle income countries there really made no difference at all. Um, so finally when we think, well, how much of the variance is actually due to being born in different countries, we can do this thing called a variance component analysis. And I'll point out in the light blue on the far side of the screen there, you can see the results that we knew about child growth. So remember I mentioned that WHO uh, study in 2006. What they found in those six countries, uh, um, remember this done sort of a decade earlier, that the, the variance due to between site differences was about 3%. It's interesting to see that in our study here, over in the white side here, the variance was almost the same sort of ballpark. So for newborn length, about almost identical, sort of 3.5%, fetal head circumference, 2.6%, and for the very little babies, not surprisingly, there's less variance, which is 1.9%. Which is so, so really consistent findings across the, the, the two studies there. And also, you can see there from the final column there, actually, Harbick had noted this back in 1974. So this is not new stuff that we uh, are, are showing here. And which, if we look actually earlier than 1974, actually Confucius had said something uh, back in 479 BC in that men's natures are alike. It is their habits that carry them far apart. So what we are showing with intergrowth is that we as human beings, as a species, are alike. The reasons why we are so different are largely to do with our habits and environments that we grow up in. Um, and, and so this leads us to the, um, the next thing I want to talk about, which is, it's a bit sort of, well, so what? Where do we go to now with these things? And the next stage, which is what I'm particularly interested in working in partnership with the Global Health Network, is introducing these international standards for fetal growth and newborn size at birth into um, clinical use and research use around the world. So we now have um, standards that look a bit like this sort of a thing. So it looks like a graph where you can come and plot your measurement when you, when you measure it with ultrasound here. This can be done electronically, obviously. It can be done for if you've got one measurement. It can be done if you've got 100,000 measurements and you want to plot where your population is, we've got the technology to do that. So we've got it for abdominal circumference also, femur length also. 
We also have newborn standards for, for the baby for weight, length and head circumference by gestational age and, and gender this time around. Note the fetal ones are just for a fetus, not for boys and girls. And these look something like this, um, which are very similar in the format to the WHO um, charts, um, purposely so. Um, the thing that really, when I came to the Intergross team, the thing that really sold to me that this is actually a valid uh, scientific concept which we are driving here and should be used is when you look at this, and this is the similarity between the size of our babies in Intergross 21st versus the size of the babies that were observed in that WHO study that was completed over a decade earlier in different countries around the world. And you can see here at 40 weeks, the mean size and standard deviation of birth weight and birth length was almost identical. And when we plot out our third, 50th and 97th centiles at 40 weeks for, for, for babies, this is just for boys, for example, it exactly aligns with where the WHO standard had been set um, as I say, you know, a decade previously. So, so what we've shown here is that we now have a way to monitor babies from nine weeks post-conception up until five years of age without babies having to leave the same chart. At the moment, this child chart is in use, but the, the fetal thing, everyone's doing their own thing, but we have the opportunity now to, to standardise the way which babies are measured. So um, that's just to summarise that in, in 2014, this is what was, was produced here. Um, and so, as I say now, the challenge now is how we get this into practice around the world and what it means for practice around the world and what will it mean for you know, how we measure babies in the UK, but also how we measure babies in sub-Saharan Africa, how we measure babies in India, in Nepal, in, in any way you, you care to mention around the world. And one of our... Um, key um, sort of aspects of our implementation project is actually our website which I um, put the sort of home page up there so that's obviously through the Global Health Network site and through this site we, we are developing a training toolkit for how clinicians can use and researchers can use this um, these new standards. We have information there about um, where the standards are being used, about the, the publications that are coming out of this project um, and hopefully we're also starting to establish a small community, which hopefully will grow, of people who um, also have sort of a passion in um, really trying to quantify the amount of growth problems there are in the world that we can potentially modify and do something about. Um, so this is my final slide here, and that's just to say that this is a very large project. This is much larger than the Nuffield Department of ONG or the University of Oxford. In fact, you know, to date we have sort of over 300 people in the projects with 27 organisations worldwide in 18 countries. And it, it's been sort of quite an honour to work with this group over the last couple of years. And um, I'm happy to take any questions about the project or where we go with this information now. Thank you.